Welcome to the Poptimist. Today we have Ned Lee. What up, Ned? Hey, how we doing? Good, man. You uh, came down to visit Nashville from Maine. It's your yep. first time down here. First time. What do you think of it so far? It's been it's been really amazing, honestly. I think it's uh, pretty much everything I'd hoped it would be in terms of um, just a really cool music city. So we've done a lot of shit so far. Yeah, we've um, you've really shown me like the East Nashville life, which. I think is not something that would be possible if I just like stayed at like a hotel or something. So sure. it's cool to have like a locals view of the city yeah. and to get like to hang out with your friends and like meet mm-hmm. a bunch of people and everyone I've met so far has been really cool. So that's been awesome. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a, a lot of music and, and shit like that going on here. Mm-hmm. Of course we grew up together in Maine, mm-hmm. which there wasn't too much going on there musically. Yeah. It's not, it's not huge. Portland, Portland is a decent music city as you know, but yeah, but it's uh it's obviously not this, this sort of size, a small scene. Yeah. A small scene, but you know, it's still got some, some cool pockets of music. There's yeah. definitely good music. I don't want to get that wrong. But. Well, one of our, uh, one of our, teachers growing up was <laughs> yeah. a big part of the music scene in portland yeah absolutely. And i think has really shaped it matt fogg mm-hmm. from the midco school of music of course he um he's been in portland well he used to teach at, at morrison then he started the music school which was really how we started to be pretty good friends because right. we, we rode right. the bus together yep. in high school we, we both lived in durham on uh, mm. stackpole road <laughs> Good old Stackpole Road. Stackpole yeah. Road, dude. It was a long bus ride from yeah, Brunswick to so Durham. Long. Way too long. And then I remember it was probably your junior year and my senior year is when Matt kind of came into the picture. I think right. you were already taking lessons with him at the time. You were taking yeah. piano lessons, right? Yeah, I, I believe I was. It's hard to remember the timeline of everything. But yeah, that sounds right. I think I was taking jazz piano lessons with him. And then he, he must have like told my mom about this program that he was going to do when we first did taken to the streets which was like the coolest thing ever for us because like, oh we, yeah we pretty much hated high school and we had this excuse to like sign up for this program where we get to leave for half the this day this was pre-taking it to the streets oh was it it yeah. wasn't called that yet it wasn't called that yet this yeah. was like the jazz right shop program right coast right. whatever it right. was bullshit that but we it got was to taking leave it school. to the streets yeah it was yeah. just we did we did matt fog charts yeah. yeah exactly and learned some awesome awesome tunes i remember we learned on broadway we i did didn't learn on broadway. i didn't even know what that meant at the time i didn't know what broadway was yeah now i know what broadway is <laughs> we learned on broadway we learned teddy bear by elvis yep uh yeah, max right. Ader was it was in there do you yeah, remember that's right. that oh, of course i do yeah he was a <laughs> piano player and he sang and then yeah. lauren yeah lauren crosby. lauren crosby yeah is that her name yeah. christabel fry right there justine kinsey yeah. yeah yeah i don't know how, remember how to say her name but yeah 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 it was it was a really cool group mostly morse kids i think we were we were some i mean were there other brunswick kids that one i can't remember I know. I just remember it being us, honestly. It might have been because it, yeah. it was all an arts program. Like other kids went mm-hmm. for like visual arts yeah. and shit like that as well. Yeah. So yeah, it, was it cool. wasn't. We were. I think we might have been like the only music kids. Mm-hmm. But not long after that is when Matt was like, "I'm doing this thing called taking it to the streets." Right. At my own music school. Yep. And that was on uh, Forest Ave. Mm-hmm. Right by that piano store. Exactly. It was like right around the corner from it. Or yeah. right behind oh, no, I know. I think it was um it was in it at first. Yeah. Because I remember we had like rehearsals where we were there, we were just like they moved some pianos aside and like made space for us. And we and I remember we in. practiced there. Um but then he then he rented the space above that. And then the piano store moved. Not that anyone really cares, but there was details. <laughs> well, it was, it also went in the back for a little while too of the piano store. Yes, right. Because right, there was yeah. the other piano store that moved. Yeah. Is there two piano stores or was it two different piano stores? Um Did it well, move Starboard Music moved like across the street. I'm, I'm sure Matt is going to be so thankful for uh, butchering the timeline of his, <laughs> his business. His I know. Career. He's probably screaming pulling <laughs> right. his hair out. I hope he ever hears this. Um, like we did not do our research, but no, we, we, we did. We're trying to recall it. this after many years of <laughs> yeah, different things. Yeah, many different things. <laughs> many different things. 
Um, but yeah, no, we did. Eating uh, all the best feet. <laughs> <laughs> that you did that with um with him at the uh, I just remember that the summer camp that was pre yeah, me. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. That yep, was before, that was but I remember you told me about eat the best feed, and that's still funny eat to me. All the best feed. <laughs> <laughs> they would change the lyrics to songs sometimes because yeah. it was inappropriate for kids right. to sing. Because right. you know it was just like a bunch of other yeah. kids in our age group, right? And uh, anytime there was something inappropriate, Matt, Matt, and Chris would try and come up with lyrics for this song yep. to make it appropriate for high schoolers <laughs> to so sing. Good. So good. But that's right. That that was for uh, "What Is Hip" what by is Tower hip? of Power, to and the lyric is "Smoke the best weed," but yep. <laughs> eating all the best feed. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. They change it to eating all the best feed. <laughs> what were some songs that we did in that first taking it to the streets? Oh, uh, um, we did Sir Duke. Yep. Use okay, me. Okay, so the first taking it to streets, as in beyond, like the high school program. Yeah, the okay. the one that was outside of it where we went yeah, to the school. Yeah, I don't know. It all blurs together. Thriller, I did a lot of them. Yeah, Thriller, right? Oh, jeez. We we did just like a uh, sign seal delivered. I think. Yeah, maybe I wish too. We might have done that. Yeah. I I think we definitely did that one. Did we do that? We did superstition yeah, a lot for of sure. Stevie Wonder tunes for sure. Mm-hmm. A lot of good classic funk music, man. Dude, that was honestly. The, probably the most valuable time in my life as a musician because mm-hmm. it set me on the course that I'm on right yeah, now. Yeah, right. It was important exposure to like some good music when so, we were probably listening to mostly trash at the time. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> you know, Green Day is my favorite band. Nothing against Green Day. But, yeah. But, you know. It's I, not I wasn't, complex. Yeah, definitely not. But um, I wasn't, I wasn't into this music yet. So mm-hmm. na- now it's like some of my... My favorite it's stuff. in our veins now. Yeah. Oh yeah. This for is sure. like the, the shit that we do. Yeah. I, it was such a, a fundamental time for me because not only was all getting exposed to all that and like mm-hmm. all the old Motown stuff and all that fundamental in my bass playing, but it was also Matt and his determination. Like I feel yeah. like Matt really pushed me so much as a mm-hmm. player, right? And really just challenged the shit out of me, for sure. And and mentally just knew how to make me angry to get right, me to work right, harder. exactly. Yeah, he had a, a particular talent for that. Yeah, for just like letting you know when you're slipping, <laughs> but like <laughs> delivering it in a in a compliment sandwich, as he would say. Because <laughs> he he taught me the ways of the compliment sandwich once I started teaching there. Um, how you just have to like, you have to, you know, you have your criticism right between two patties of like, you did this great, like right amount of notes, just not the right ones. <laughs> and you're referring to, to what Matt, uh, what Matt would say to us, which yeah. is right amount of notes, just play the right ones. <laughs> yeah. A lot of good, good stuff like that. I remember yeah. this one time though. I, I don't know if, if I missed the compliment sandwich. I felt like Matt just jumped straight to <laughs> criticism with me. Maybe he saw he could take it. Probably so. Oh, yeah. I remember we were doing uh, the Beatles ensemble. Mm-hmm. And I had played in a couple different groups for him as, as a, the bass player. And one yeah. was for... Uh, we were doing Hey Jude and we were doing the end of it. Yeah. And I was playing these lines. I just thought it was so good. I thought yeah. it was so cool. I remember we ended it. Uh-huh. And Matt, all he said was, that wasn't even musical. And then we just, <laughs> it was the end of rehearsal. That was oh, it. Oh, no. <laughs> that it's was, so good. That was all. Yeah. But. Yeah. Did you see uh, Whiplash? I did, yes. Yeah, it's, it's not like that, but. N- Matt, N- Matt's not that crazy. <laughs> no, He never not. threw anything at us. <laughs> no. Perhaps he mentally, uh, yeah. mentally pushed us. Yeah, he, he pushed us, but he he wasn't like abusive like that guy. But no, he's like it was like a super light version of that. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, which we needed at the time. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah. it just it. Uh, even to this day, I would say Matt Fogg is probably the most business savvy musician I've ever met. Out of anybody in Nashville, out of anybody. Yeah. That I've met in my journeys along the way. Yeah. You know, kind of like, a unique character in that mm-hmm. way in terms of like meeting a musician who's savvy in that way because we all know there are so many musicians who have no instincts like no that. No clue. Yeah. No business instinct. Yeah. What were some things that you learned f- from him? Oh, I mean, 
lots of things. I mean, I think he really taught, drilled into my head just like the importance of, you know, it's 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 work and not talent. Like nobody is successful just just based on, you know, being talented. Like you have to work hard to make it in music. And um, he, I guess, to, you know, I I remember, um, you know, I I had taken lessons with him for some time, and. You know, you can only say so much to, like, someone learning music. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't really get what you mean when you say, like, you have to you have to practice hard to, like, get good. Yes. And uh, I remember when I came back from my first year of music school, I'd taken a break after that. And um, I took, like, a lesson with Matt. And I practiced some, like, jazz piano stuff for a week. And I came back. And he's like, well, Ned, you've improved more in one week post school than you had in your prior two years of like taking lessons with me. So music school must have done something for you. And that was true. Like, um, you know, I had like my, my ego kind of like stomped on my first year of music. Mm. It was just like a rude awakening in terms of what kind of level you're expected to be at. And I just realized there was a whole different skill set that I hadn't, um, hadn't acquired yet. So. What was the skill set? I, I just mean, um, coming into like uh, a university setting like getting a music degree when you're primarily like a self-taught guitar player who has taken lessons here and there um but like i didn't read music i didn't really know theory well through matt i did read a little bit of music mm -hmm. and um i've still told this story to a lot of people because it like really captures like how how much of like a fish out of water i was when i first got to uh, music school because when I first got charts I was a jazz performance major and didn't know anything about jazz but they gave me charts and they're just like you got to learn this for like practice on Friday and I'd be like okay and I'd look at the sheet and like sitting there with my guitar I'd have no idea what to do with that um, so what I did is I would sit down at one of the pianos and I'd plunk out the notes on the piano and then I'd learn it from the piano by ear on my guitar because that was easier for me than just finding the right notes on guitar. Like, I didn't even know what the notes were in the neck. So it was just like, I had no idea. When did that change for you? Well, over the course of that year, I really practiced reading very basic guitar music a lot. Um, yeah, it felt like my first year of music school, it's like I wasn't really at my level of musical ability. I was just kind of catching up in terms of learning these fundamental skills that are necessary for school that I had never learned mm -hmm. fully on guitar, especially because I was, I was more proficient, like reading music, uh, you know, and piano because of Matt, but in my guitar lessons, we just like looked at tabs and like, I knew some scales or, but you know, if you, if I was like playing a solo and you asked me what notes am I playing, I wouldn't have a fucking clue. I feel like uh, guitar sheet music is way harder to read than piano. Um, I don't know if that's true as like a generality. It can be hard, but I mean, there's some like, I mean, compared to like the basic stuff you learn starting out as a piano player, yes, but I mean, there's some insane like piano music that I look at and it's like way beyond sure. anything I've ever attempted yeah I, what i guess what i meant was just like looking at it uh the way that the chords are stacked yeah and, and shit like that for uh yeah for guitar it's, i guess it, it seems to be yeah. kind of written in a different way yeah since it's a different instrument right well one thing that's easier with piano music is you have one note you know every every note on the staff equals one note on the piano whereas with guitar if you have a certain note on the staff, there might be like seven different places that you could be playing that note. Yeah. Um, so there is kind of like, you have to learn these like hieroglyphics that tell you like what position you should be in, what string you're playing on, what right hand finger you're playing. Not, I got that from classical guitar and it's very useful to me now, actually. So your primary area of focus was classical guitar in school yeah, for so, a time. Yeah. I really, I was just like, I was a square peg trying to fit in a round hole. So um, my first my first year of music school, I was a jazz performance major. Um, and for some reason, they kind of discriminate. If you're a jazz major, they make you take jazz and classical guitar lessons. 
and you know like so many jazz players are so pissed about that you know because they just want to do jazz they don't they don't care about classical at all um and they're not classical guitarists so they just like force them to do that which may or may not be good for them um but as a classical guitar major you don't have to take jazz um you can just skip all that stuff altogether um so i think there is still kind of like some level of stigma yeah there's a stigma and just kind of like I don't know if discrimination is the right word for it, but I, I don't know. It's it's almost like the I, – well, for one thing, just like jazz has been taught in university for way less time. Like that established like education and, and of course, yeah. classical music way predates jazz, of course. But, um, but what was I saying about that? Uh, oh, oh yeah so anyway at school. to get to the point i i then became a classical guitar major um because i realized that i'd had more exposure to that kind of music and it naturally came to me more um when i started practicing that it just made sense to me and i think i also liked my teacher a lot more um, my jazz teacher was pretty like robotic and like only communicated in theory so if like you don't know theory it sounds like you're it's like you're trying Chinese. to like do coding or something, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, my classical teacher was was really great, and I'm still not. I would not really even identify myself as a classical guitarist, but I did study that for a few years, and um, it gave me a good foundation. What did you get your degree in? For um, music? After all that, I ended up getting a BA in music, which is just kind of the most generic music degree, um, but that kind of allowed me a little more freedom to just explore my actual areas of interest instead of being tied to a specific Mm -hmm. program. So I graduated with a BA, but I was a jazz performance major, then a classical guitar performance major, and then I just switched to the BA. I remember also there was a period of time where you would take, you would be going to music school, take a sabbatical, go back to music school, take another sabbatical. Yep. Well, yeah, my first year was the jazz year. I realized I didn't know anything about jazz and, you know, that's where my, I just like over the course of a year came to understand that previous to university, I was a big fish in a small pond Mm -hmm. and that I had this perception of like who I was and like how good I was. Um, I had an ego about me like a little bit, like I, I thought I had something going on and then I was just like (laughs) trying to get through music school. Yeah. And it's just constantly shitting on me because it's like all these all these skills I just don't have. And like, nobody asks you to just like sit down and like jam to a song or like learn a song by ear. Um, But one of my teachers did realize that that was actually a small part of our, our lessons is we had to like transcribe a jazz solo. And his first, first time he gave me the solo and he was just like, learn as much as you can by ear. And I learned a decent amount by ear and came back and it kind of occurred to him like, Oh, this kid like has, you know, an understanding of music. He just doesn't have all these skills Mm -hmm. that we teach with at school. So he kind of cut me some slack there. He's like, okay, you you know how to, you know how to play a little bit. Yeah. Um, you have an ear for music. You just, you've never learned all these skills and, um, all the motor skills. Yeah. Yeah. So I did take a sabbatical after that year because it was very confusing for me. And, um, that's when I left school, saved money and traveled and went to South America what did you so do in was, South America? That was a long sabbatical. So I went to Peru for six months. Um, so I left school, saved some money. Um, yeah, left for South America with like $5,000. And yeah, went on this epic quest around Peru for six months and just just kind of like wanderlust, just exploring. <laughs> Matt called it my spirit quest. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like Back a spirit here. quest. Yeah, it kind of was, honestly, yeah. So it was a it was an exciting journey, but then I came back and sort of I don't know, it's just like milling around for a while. Like I moved to Portland after that, which was great. And worked across some, from the State Theater. Yes, and then I worked some dead end jobs and wasn't doing a whole lot for a couple of years, and then decided I wanted to go back and finish music school. Yeah, mm-hmm. which was yeah. So was what was your practice routine like during? when you were going to school and what was it like when during those sabbaticals, what were you doing? Um, so initially when I left music school, um, 
I was just at this junction in my life, which I was really just like questioning, like, what the hell do I want to do? Like from here, like, Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if music school was right for me because like I managed to do well and get like decent grades. But, um, I just, I could really sense that like, I wasn't necessarily cut out for this type of musical environment. Like I had, I knew I had a certain musical skill set. Um, I knew where my skills were and it just seemed like university was everything about where my skill set was not. Yeah. So it was just a really difficult adjustment. Um, but intimidating. I, yeah. Oh, very intimidating. Yeah, definitely. I felt like I felt, I felt so incompetent. Like <laughs> I think I just learned to like hate myself that year, honestly, because yeah. like I would just, I don't know, I'd drag myself to these these like rehearsals and like play with these people who knew what what the hell they were doing you know and they'd like play these charts and then they'd take solos and they told me to take a solo and i'd be like i just want to shoot myself like because mm-hmm. i knew i was going to play some like total garbage because i didn't understand like you know jazz forms and like what scales to play over what and i was just learning this from like you know from floor one yeah you know so it was just like they just I just felt kind of like thrown to the wolves and that there was no one, there was no one to like guide me through this process knowing that I was like, you know, I didn't come from the same background as everyone else Mm -hmm. because everyone else seemed to be like, you know, it seemed like they just were passionate about like high school band and then just like coasted right on into like USM. And I think that does happen. I think they just make that easy. Yeah. I think USM does like a lot of recruiting and that's Mm -hmm. a university. So they're main, by the way. Um, I think they recruit a lot of people from high schools and just like say, Hey, you might be able to get a scholarship. Come here. Just like keep doing what you're doing. So for most people, it's not this crazy adjustment, but for me it was because I was never in high school band. I wasn't even in jazz band, you know, Played in bands in high school, but yeah. they were like my own. Like, yeah, rock, rock bands. bands. Yeah, let's talk about the rock bands we yeah, were in, sure. in in high school for yeah. a minute. What uh, what bands were you in? Um, I had, I had a, a couple. We were really into uh, uh, what what is it? Not not acronyms, but uh, alliterations. When uh, when I was like in high school, I guess, because I think I had two bands that didn't really go anywhere. Um, one was called Stolen Serenity. I remember. And Stolen another one Serenity. was called Common Catastrophe, <laughs> which sounds like the same like name, just like two like bands. Um, but then the first like band that did something that I was in that like had shows that was called Summer Before We Fall, and that was a very angsty With metal band. Yeah. Uh, no, Cameron was not in this one. Uh, this was before Cameron. Sam Woodward. Sam. Sam was in both. Sam was in all of my high school bands, actually. Yes. Um, as well as the first taking it to the streets with us. Yes. Right. With exactly. the professor. Uh, professor Connolly <laughs> was was the other drummer. Yeah. 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 Um. <clears throat> so yeah, that was with Sam Woodward, John Wagner, and uh, Matt Smith. Yeah, oh, and uh, Chris Steves eventually. We had we had a few different bassists. Uh, we I feel like from. I remember that. Yeah, all they had to do was just play one note, though. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just yeah. play an open D, and we'll be mm-hmm. good. I'll do all the rest. <laughs> yeah. And uh, did you guys play the talent show? Right? Did you guys ever play the um, Brunswick ta- talent show no, or no. like play ever play at the school? No, but I remember when your band did. Yeah, I remember you guys doing the Franz Ferdinand cover. Yeah. That with was Charlie uh, Hood. with Charlie Hood. Yeah, <laughs> Charlie was the uh, was the front man of. Uh, yeah. Well, there was two. Two versions of that band. The mm-hmm. first version was Sons of Verona. Yeah, yeah. Which was were named after the city in uh, Romeo and Juliet, oh, Verona. Okay, okay. And then the second version of that band. So the first version was Simon Tracy mm-hmm. uh, on drums, me on bass. Yeah. Luca. Uh, Luke Haynes on guitar. Luke Haynes. Do you remember him? He was in my grade. Uh, no, not really, but... And then Charlie was singing. And then eventually we were like, okay, we're going to do something different. Yeah. And then we were uh, The Science with uh, with David Wright and Alex Tour. Right. Okay, that's the, And that's Alex what I played keys and he played guitar. Right. So he was like our secret weapon. Yeah, I remember man. Alex Tool. Um, we also did Sex on Fire. We, yeah. We did, we did a, a mashup of uh, Sex on Fire and yeah. Take Me Out. 
and Charlie yeah, right. threw out a bunch of like glow sticks into the audience. Yeah, that I remember. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, I, that was a super valuable time period for me. I played with Simon Tracy all four years of high school, mm-hmm. and play, as a bass player, playing with a drummer was crazy because right. we started off playing with uh, Vacation Land, and that was like the eighth grade, maybe freshman year. This and is that the previous was previous formation of the band. This was me, Simon, Kane. Oh, yep. And we had uh, Cameron Toy was in it for a uh, time too. Oh, really? Yeah, that okay, was like the... Cameron Toy was in uh, my in Common Catastrophe and Stolen Serenity. Yeah. So this be was buddies. this was before yeah. that, uh-huh. as far as the timeline okay. goes. Okay. But uh, eventually, that all fell apart, like yeah. all high school bands do. Right. Yeah. Because um, everybody starts smoking weed and getting laid, and it just falls. Yeah. Up, right. Falls apart. Um. But yeah, that's that's what happened, uh, and eventually Brandon Baker got in the band, okay. and it was me, Brandon Baker, Simon, and Kane, wow. and we we cycled through a couple different singers. Yeah, wow. I can't even remember everybody we band, had dude? in. <laughs> dude, I know it was like everybody in, in our school. Right. Yeah, anybody was just like, "Yeah, I'm into music. I yeah. want to try doing like, music." Right. And we're like, "Okay, like cowbell." Yeah, you're you're in the band now. Yeah. We're banned. Yep. Um. But yeah, it was super valuable. Mm-hmm. Like we, uh, especially that final, that final version of it, the science, because we started doing like a lot of like rhythmic drum and bass stuff that we yep. hadn't really done before, and that's when we were playing stuff like Franz Ferdinand, right. and the Bravery, mm-hmm. um, the Bravery, the rock mm-hmm. stuff that I was into mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. That was a fun time. It was music. a fun time. Yeah, <laughs> dude, we're we're. We're still young, but we're not yeah. young like we were yeah. anymore. Right. <laughs> I know, dude. You're getting gray. <laughs> I know, dude. I'm starting to get gray hair. It's crazy. I can't I can't believe it, dude. I've been yeah. playing music now for – since I was 15 years old. Mm-hmm. It's almost – that's 13 years I've been doing this. Yeah. That's, I feel like it's also been like 13 years for me. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really it's remember. It's fucking crazy, Lose dude. Lose count. I just know I started playing guitar in seventh grade. Cause that, that was what the cool kids did. Oh yeah. So I was just committed to that. Did I ever tell you why I started playing bass? No. Like how I became a bass player? Why? Okay. So we were in Kane Stevenson's basement and we were listening to American Idiot by Green Day. And sure, Kane no, was... no weed was there. No, actually this was pre-weed. <laughs> oh, really? This was pre-weed. Okay. All right. Um, we were playing, uh, he was playing guitar. And he was playing American Idiot, and I told him I wanted I wanted to play guitar too. I was like, I really uh-huh. want to do music. Yeah. And he said, uh, "There can't be two guitars in a band. I have to play bass." Yeah. So that's how so I became that's a how that's decided. how I became a bass player. So Kane Stevenson. Kane decided Stevenson his... decided I was a bass player, <laughs> and that decided my fate for life. Wow, dude! Wow. Every decision I've made has stemmed from that one in some yeah. way. Wow. Of Kane telling me there can't be two guitars yeah, in a right. band. You ever think about like in an alternate universe where Kane was playing bass and he was like, "Dude, you got to play guitar." I know, yeah. I, <laughs> maybe I wouldn't be in Nashville right now. Right. Maybe I would have never played with Matt Fogg. Dude, yeah. Wow. Imagine if Kane could have known like how much of a deciding moment for your future, like that. He would have totally made. abused the the power. Right. <laughs> he can't like, be trusted with something like, like that. You got to play the spoons, man. <laughs> That's gonna be your instrument. It's funny to look back on that time because not only was I doing that stuff, but when um, when I first moved to Durham from Brunswick when my dad retired from the Navy, mm-hmm. we moved next door to this family, the Mess Plays. I don't know if you if you ever met them. The Mess Plays, no, I don't know. So um, they also lived on Stackpole. I, we lived at 507 and then they lived at 509. Okay. Or maybe it was backwards. Maybe I got that backwards. But... The guy who lived there, his name was uh, Taylor Mesplay and his wife, Rebecca, and they had three kids. Mm -hmm. And Taylor was just about to open his own studio and live venue in Lewiston called The Maple Room. Okay. It was right next to She Doesn't Like Guthrie's. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess Guthrie's owns that place now. Oh, interesting. I, I actually played a gig there like this past year. Really? Yeah. And it was a pretty fun place to play. Yeah. Yeah. So the Guthrie's is what previously was that place, the Maple Room? Um, well, I know they bought 
or they were they talked about buying that place. Mm-hmm. I don't know what actually ended up happening. Were, yeah. were you playing in like a small little was, room or was a it small a restaurant? Little cafe sort okay. of thing? Yeah, so like it had it, a bunch of tables and yeah, yeah, wasn't very big. They, they were talking about, from what I heard, buying the other side of it because they always refer yeah. to it as the other side. Okay, but the Maple Room, its layout was there was a stage. You walk down the hall, and then there was a recording studio that was mm-hmm. built. And this was in Lewiston, Maine. Right. Of all places. Yeah. Which Lewiston just was a dark place. And this was yeah. like during the recession years. Yeah, they call it the Dirty Lou. The Dirty Lou, yeah. yeah. It's a gross place, dude. <laughs> it's it's got very, some hidden gems, but... It does. It's not my favorite what place. What dirty or bad? Uh, I don't know. It was just like an old factory yeah. town that had seen better days. Y- yeah. Yeah. That was, I think, mainly it. It was like kind of like the ghost of what it was. Yeah, there are a lot of towns like that in Maine. That just Old like, mill towns. Yeah, like that, Lisbon. Even though Lisbon seems to be like bouncing back. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of those towns that just like, you know, a certain time period hit. All these manufacturing jobs went away. And then, yeah. you know, it's just kind of a shell of what it was. <clears throat> Story of a lot of America. Mm-hmm. You know? But um, at the Maple Room, some important things happened for me there. Uh, I saw Bill Frizzell play. Oh, shit. Really? He ca- he played there. That's cool. Um, and I was just like an intern there. And every Monday night, there was a jazz night. And I think mm-hmm. this was the beginning of my love affair with jazz. Cool. And there was this group <laughs> that played uh, mm-hmm. called the Snow Monks. Cool. And it was... Uh, Mark Tipton was playing trumpet uh-huh. in Snow Monks. I can't remember the other guy's names other yeah. than there was a poet named Gil. So they were improv and this guy would be doing poetry. Interesting. It was like this avant-garde yeah. jazz. He was kind of like a beatnik. He wore all black every single time. Wow. And he would always order Chinese food and wine. Like every Monday night, that was his ritual. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> no one ever came to the Monday night jazz nights at the Maple Room. Yeah. It was me and Taylor Mess play and then the Snow Monks. Yeah. But I got to be there and I got to talk to all these musicians mm-hmm. and like pick their brains and find out what it was like to be a musician. At the time, these guys yeah. were probably like between 22 and 25 maybe. Cool. Yeah. Except for Gil, who was probably, I imagine, at least in his early 50s at the time. Mm-hmm. But it was uh, so valuable just to listen to musicians yeah. play. Yeah, absolutely. being that young, being surrounded by musicians yeah. who it's important. We're doing it. Yeah, you gotta surround, gotta be surrounded by people who are better than you. That's, I think that's another takeaway I got from from music school is just like the importance of that, because I I would have stayed kind of like this, you know, I would have had an ego and I would have been this big fish in a small pond. For way too long and uh um it's uh, dangerous there's like a there's a term for that um i forget the name of it. there's like a psychological term for uh, the dunning kruger effect have you heard of that no okay it's so it's like dunning kruger or these psychologists and they observed that people's perceived level of competency um is way higher towards the beginning then in kind of like the middle say like there's this spectrum for like here you're a complete beginner here you're a master well your perception of your competency has like a reverse bell curve so you start thinking you're kind of competent and then once you realize how good other people are like say you know you see some like amazing jazz guitarist or something and realize oh i know how to play american idiot well this guy knows how to do this so then you take this like you go way down in your perception of like how good you are. Mm -hmm. And that's important because that's the beginning of the upward slope towards actual mastery. Like you have to perceive that you're not that great before, before you get to the point where you can be great. You have to be Nemo in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. That's how I feel here. Yeah, exactly. That's part of the reason I want, to move to a city like Nashville is to just be kind of like drowning in this like sea of talent where I'm really nothing special, you know? And I think that's a, that's an important feeling because that will kind of like urge you to, yeah. to really dig deep and like find out what you're trying to say, you know? That's what happened for me, you know, 
it took me a couple of years to really figure out what it was I wanted to do and what it was I wanted to be as a musician. And there's no one to really decide that for me except for me. Yeah. Because it was like kind of what you went through at music school I went through when I first moved here. Yeah, right. Because I knew I was good. I never felt like I had much of an ego surrounding my playing, mm-hmm. though. I think my, my self-esteem, if anything, was too like too low. Mm-hmm. I felt too bad about myself, yeah. and I wasn't willing to take more right. risk. Um, but really, the, the past month or so, something just clicked for me as far as my playing goes, where I really have learned to practice... Yeah. In a very efficient way, and I'm skating along the edge of my ability every time I yeah, practice now. Yeah. You're very much on the wagon right now. It's yes. Seems. And, uh, yeah, it oh. took me going to music school to get on that wagon, and I feel like I'm off the wagon since, since graduation because I'm just kind of doing this, like, post-grad flounder, mm-hmm. as they call it. You know, just figuring out what the hell do I actually want to do with my life and, like, what is music's role in my life. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think moving to a city like nashville is part of that is just answering those questions it comes in cycles too yep um there have been times where i've been in nashville where i haven't done much with music Mm -hmm. uh i think those days are kind of behind me a little bit more so now because i really feel like i have a firm grasp on what i'm doing and like why i'm here i remember a time where you were like working like three jobs and yeah that's all you were doing yeah that's that's exactly it you know i i was just hustling and it's yeah. like i i got to the point though after a couple of years of of being here and having a good support system with re- truly i i'm surrounded by good people yeah now. You, you really are it's, good it's impressive good friends like people i really trust and that i connect with and that i play music with mm-hmm. and um i think that's a testament <clears throat> ca- to kind of what it what it is that I, my life has become. Yeah. I think that's how, how you can truly measure yeah. a good quality life is the kind of people oh, that you have in it. You I think know, that's I one of the greatest like markers of like how well you're doing in life. Mm-hmm. You know, have a good circle of people around you. That's, that's a really important thing. And that's honestly something that I'm kind of scared about when it comes to like moving. Sure. It's just like the, the concept of just starting from the beginning, you know? Too. Yeah. I yeah. Right. Thing. Yeah, man, it's a it's a freaky thing. It's a it's a real leap of faith to do that. So, I think it's the most important leap of faith that someone in their twenties can take, though. Yeah, I would have to agree. You know, you know, it's like your options are you you take this leap of faith and like grow from it, or you just become a townie. <laughs> yeah, dude. And you know what, dude? Yeah. I was uh, it was funny. I I had flirted for a couple of years with becoming with a being townie. a townie. Oh, dude. That's one of my worst fears, actually. Do you remember that when I was like, I had uh, you were hanging around Brunswick. I was hanging around Brunswick a ton because I, I yeah. had uh, I had left, gone down to Florida for six months, came back, right, left for like a a year, um, yeah, to go to Colorado, mm-hmm. right, came back. Got a job. I was working at BEK, which was a very another valuable time in my life. Right. Selling copiers, being an IT salesman. Yeah, you were being a salesman, right? And that's when I was living on Pleasant Street in Brunswick. Yeah, dude. At that apartment. Yeah. Which uh, I remember that? Those are some good times there too. Yeah, it was. Um, but yeah, I was uh, I was on the path to become a townie dude, where I was just like gonna be smoking yeah. weed all the time, getting high, not doing anything. Yeah. It's a terrifying process. Yeah. Every Friday night at Joshua's. Yeah. Shit like that, dude. Yeah, just being like resigned to your life being nothing special by the time you're like 25 is just a scary That's thing. That's hell, dude. Yeah, that is a type of spiritual hell, you know? Yeah. To be trapped in that limbo, like you're not going to achieve anything great. You're just going to kind of like coast through your life. It's going to be all right. Like, you know. Go to Applebee's not gonna take on any, Friday. Yeah, not going to take any risks just gonna I'm just gonna live my days out here and i mean i think some people are more cut out for that but it's like it's it's scarier when you have a person who had like a, a greater ambition but then decided to just not pursue that oh yeah and that's that's what i'm really afraid of i think yeah, at this at this like nexus in my life where i'm figuring out what is the next step it's scary for me to think about just not realizing my potential yeah and never really exploring that at all but 
because you're afraid of that, you're aware of it. Yeah. And just don't knock anybody up right. and you'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And the fear of the fear of that is part of what just like keeps you going, you know, you know, you just got to know, like I'd way rather, you know, I'm, I'm scared of like music not working out, but it's, it's scarier to think about just never trying. Oh and yeah. Just like resigning to like, Oh, you know, it, it's not going to happen. Like at this age. Well, as someone who is knee deep in it and doesn't have much for security in the way of mm-hmm. like yeah. normal life things. Right. Yeah. Um, I will say I have a high amount of satisfaction out of the life that I am living. Though, yeah. Even though I don't have much security. Right. Like I do music. I, um, I do the podcast. Uh, I produce for people on the, on the side here and there. I also um, drive for Uber and Lyft. I work at a radio station, which is all shit. If I would have told me that when I was 16, I would have been over the moon about the life that I'm living right now. Right, I would have freaked right. the fuck out, thought I hit yeah, the jackpot. Because I fucking have. Yeah. This is really, truly the dream. Yeah, living the dream, man. The journey is the dream. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I always, I guess the way that I think that it's different now versus what it was back then would be I thought I would be playing like arenas, you know what I mean? Or, or in <laughs> yeah. some band. Yeah. Like there was a thousand bands that I could have been in. Right. Some shit like that. And you know what? I'm really grateful that I didn't go down that path. Mm-hmm. And I found my own path. Um and I found the podcast because it was like podcasting I heard about it in high school just because Mark Hoppus had one. Mm-hmm. He had a podcast called Hi My Name is Mark. Right. From Blink one eighty two. Yep. But it was not like it was in the micro of the micro. Yeah. You know, I didn't right. get into like Joe Rogan. I got into Joe Rogan when I lived in Colorado. Yeah, that makes sense. But there was have been no way to predict like when I grow up I'm gonna be a podcaster. Right. Because that wasn't a career option back then. Right. I know. It's a it's a cool field. I I really like, you know, the way Joe Rogan puts it is just that like you know, people don't really do this anymore. Just like sit down and have conversations yeah. about like life and just like things in general. Um, we're all just like constantly distracted. Oh yeah. You know, so it's a, it is a really cool medium, even though it's just like the simplest thing. You're just like sitting here with two microphones. It's, it's interesting to just like record like a real conversation. And it, yeah, it's interesting that people are want to hear that yes. too, you know, that there's a real like, there's a need for that. Totally. Okay. Absolutely. I think mm-hmm. I think there's a, a hunger for it. Mm-hmm. Like uh and this is not my idea, but Jordan Peterson, he had said that the like the podcasting and YouTube revolution is as big or bigger than the printing press getting invented. Mm-hmm. Cuz all of a sudden people who can't read, they can listen. Yeah. And right. like they can figure out how to get clean water if they're in some remote african country right just like the dissemination of information it's democratized now right for the most part for the most part it's not 100 percent there yet (laughs) but we're on on the path to that i think we're on the path to true enlightenment and i want to believe so strongly that it starts with the individual just pursuing whatever it is they want in life and pursuing their own path i think it it can only start with the individual and uh You know, I think it's idealistic to see us, like, moving towards enlightenment, but I like to think that that's happening just at, like, this glacial human pace. Like... I, too, have done mushrooms. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Like, I don't think humanity is going to be enlightened within our lifetime or anything, but we're, yeah, we're, like, ascending, hopefully. Like, Jordan Peterson's also talked about how just, like, you look at these baseline stats for just quality of life for all of humanity. Just like the, uh, the bar for like the average of humanity is, is like lifting. Like there are less people in poverty and, you mm-hmm. know, less people going hungry and it's, it's like slowly creeping up, but it's like important to r- remind ourselves that society is making positive changes, yeah. even though what seems like is happening is like all we hear about is more and more negativity and more problems. But we, 
but our minds are just they're designed to pay attention to that more to threats so yeah so media just media in general understands the fact that like you know bad news sells way better than good news even though we'd like to hear some good news every now and then that's one thing i like about uh cory wong who we saw at third and lindsley yeah is he has this very optimistic persona yeah you know yeah. everything's very positive yeah and he's always smiling right he's really enjoying playing yeah like, he is like a positive spiritual person yeah yeah and it blew our fucking socks yeah, off when dude, we saw him so live good. dude he's so good it was very funky yeah that was amazing yeah he just packed so much funk yeah yeah it's, it's so great that drummer too the drummer was really oh, good stupid good that oh, was a fun night yeah, yeah it, was, it was packed in there yeah sold out it was a sold out show and it's funny because we uh your first night that you got to nashville we mm-hmm. went there and we saw my good yeah. friends no name blues play right, and they were awesome which was yes they were great yeah. which is josh norfleet kirk morrow jr and dustin mm-hmm. mckee yep so you got to meet them yeah and you got to see the venue as like a yeah. live like a right local show yeah it was honestly like the coolest thing to just get to uh like arrive in nashville and immediately go to a show um, and just see like these these local bands play and perform at a really cool venue. Like, yeah, that that was probably my favorite venue that I saw. I mean, I went to the Ryman, took the tour, but like, I need to see a show there to really oh, yeah. understand oh, yeah. the Ryman. I think yeah, definitely. You know, just seeing like an empty theater. You know, auditorium. you can feel the spirit in there. Yeah. But it's another thing to actually see someone play. Right. Because they take on that spirit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to see that. It's amazing. You want to do some news? Sure. Sure. (laughs) Prince Harry speaks of great sadness after agreement with Queen Elizabeth about royal exit. So Prince Harry stepped out for his first public appearance for nearly two weeks after he and uh, his wife Meghan announced their decision to step down as senior members of the royal family. This is a big deal. Yeah. Like, this is, like, all over What, the they're, like, they're disowning themselves from the royal family? Yeah, like, they're, they're, yeah. Huh. It's like, I don't know, the president was just like, oh, I'm not the president. <laughs> right. It's like, I don't know. Well, it's that like, might happen like, soon. Donald Trump Jr. is just like, fuck you, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um... I wonder how much this has to do, the conspiracy theorist in me wonders how much this has to do with Prince Andrew and Jeffrey Epstein. Oh, so like, <laughs> if, they, if they're trying to get out of the way of whatever's about to go down. Because right. that's what it makes me think of. Yeah, wow. I, there's oh, wow. no real reason why they did. Um, yeah, there's, there's not much reason. On, on Sunday, Harry, 35, attended an event organized for supporters and a sensible charity which aimed at supporting the mental health and well-being of children afflicted by HIV. All right. Which is like his last thing he did. Oh. Yeah. And there's really not much that... <clears throat> huh. You know what that move is? It's a fuck it, I'm never going to be king my brother's going to be. Yeah. yeah I feel like that's, that's a big part of it. Yeah. Oh, uh, wait, was he... He's was the he younger... Prince? He, he's the younger, the younger brother. He was an heir to the throne? Um, or he was the young. Oh, oh, I see. He's what you're the saying. the okay. young. Yeah, he's, he's the, like, oh, I'm not gonna be king anyway. Yeah, so fuck, it. fuck it. I'm, oh, I'm out of here. Yeah, so he's just moving his wife yeah. and then They're supposed to be moving to like uh, British Columbia or some yeah. shit like that. Well, they were gonna move to Canada, but Canada was like, no. Oh, they're gonna oh. move to Los Angeles, bro. Probably. That's where they're gonna move because right. that chick is an actress. Okay. Is she- yeah, the, the, there's already been, they've already been talking yeah. like about her becoming like a an actress again and starting to do all that shit. Mm. I mean, that's a great way to get A list roles is to be a fucking former princess. Yeah, to the fucking royal family. Probably doesn't hurt. Yeah, let's do okay. it. Uh, Puerto Rico emergency director fired after residents discover warehouse full of Hurricane Maria supplies. Whoa. So. Um, the uh, emergency aid is believed to be from when Hurricane Maria hit the island two years ago, the governor said. So I'm guessing, like, they had these supplies and he didn't use them? Yeah, that's what it sounds like. That's awful. That's fucked up, dude. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, there is, like, the off chance that he didn't know. Well, it was like there was also that 
uh, that like drone footage or the pictures, drone pictures or whatever of a bunch of water just abandoned in the field in Puerto Rico. Like, I, did you guys see that shit too? No. There was like a, some picture that got posted of a, uh, of runway of a runway. And there was a bunch of just like water that got dumped there uh-huh. and it was just abandoned there. No one was getting like it. Like drinking water. Mm-hmm. Huh. Oh, wow. Here's something. He said about, uh, 600 pallets of water were distributed when Hurricane Dorian and Hurricane Karen threatened Puerto Rico, and during a drought that affected the island last year, nearly 80 of those pallets remained in the warehouse because they were because they expired. He said, "Water expired. Water expired." Yeah. I wonder if it has something to do with the plastic or something. Maybe. Well, it expired, so I guess like. It doesn't matter now. Matter. Yeah. But really doesn't seem like he did, made the right decision. That's no. Interesting. Um, yeah. Let's get to the next one. All right. Um, <laughs> I read this one so thoroughly. Yeah. It's <laughs> funny. Uh, deaf man sues Pornhub claiming lack of closed captions is discrimination. <laughs> <laughs> this there, is not uh, the, there's that's a reason hilarious. that this guy is alone and jerking off. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. Yeah. I, I don't really understand. So he's suing because there's no closed closed captions, right? But because the dialogue's always so good, you know, you never want to miss it. The the (laughs) acting is great, (laughs) right? (laughs) Just can't follow the storyline. What's going on here? (laughs) So um, I'll I'll read a little bit of it. A New York man, so it's New York, not Florida. I thought it was Florida. Yeah, Uh, Mm -hmm. suing Pornhub parent company MindGeek for allegedly failing. Proper closed captions for deaf and hearing impaired pornography consumers. Yarl, I don't want to uh, mispronounce his name, but it's Yarso Yaroslav Saras Saras, who is deaf, says he was denied equal access to such titles as "sexy cop gets witness to." <laughs> oh man! Videos on MindGeek. Sites, yeah, dude. Uh, Wow. Yeah, dude, I'd be pissed too. Dude, America's getting way too soft in any day. Yeah. Oh, Yellowstone is going to blow and just wipe <laughs> us all out. Bro, I hope it does wipe me out. If it if it blows, uh, I hope I die right away, dude. Yeah, dude. I hope I'm standing on top of the volcano if that happens. Oh wow! So he's suing to get uh, a premium subscription. Oh, that's oh, hilarious. God, that's so, low. <laughs> Oh, wow. Damn. Uh, I bet, honestly, they're probably going to do it. It's going to be a huge marketing thing. Yeah, then, they're going to spin it into a positive for themselves. Anybody could be like, oh, I'm hearing impaired. And then they get like... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, maybe uh, maybe Andrew Yang, in addition to <laughs> universal basic income, he can also run on this. <laughs> Pornhub premium for everyone. Pornhub porn up premium and one f- free pizza <laughs> delivery a week. <laughs> wow. America's that, productivity uh, just fucking tanks. Uh, <laughs> Did you see that article that was like every U.S. citizen at birth should be designated somebody to mate with? What? what uh, no. What is yeah, that? It was like, it was is this like, the incel community? Yeah, he's like, he's like we, should, we shouldn't have to find a mate. Wow, that's that's a scary level of yeah. entitlement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of terrifying. I feel like you meet guys like that who have that perception, and it's like they're just like predators, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and they're just like not socially aware. Yeah, yeah. It's scary. Yeah, you know, I, there was a time in my life where I had a lot of like uh, a lot of fucked up views. It wasn't quite like that. Right. I just really felt like I was uh fighting against the system in a big way. Mm-hmm. And it was because yeah. I never really felt like anybody was on my side. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like you're not 
that estranged from that. Just the Maybe. other day, you're like, "Fuck jobs, <laughs> like fucking hate jobs, dude." Well, and I was like, I will "Dude, I'm pretty stand, sure there's some jobs are good." I will stand. I will stand behind that. <laughs> I did say that. All right, fuck jobs, 2024. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll run for, right, for yeah, president. Stick um, the man. But no, I think. Uh, a lot of guys who are like that or, or think those kind of things is because they're they're lonely and they're outcasts and they don't really have right any kind of outlet. It's not necessarily right that they believe or think that, but there's like this this reason that they do believe yeah. and think that feel hopeless. They f- exactly, and I know I know you saw it, the Joker. Yeah, that's what the Joker was really oh, yeah. about. Yeah. yeah. Right. You're cast to the side. No one pays have, attention. You don't have yeah. Right, right. It's just like it's America's Shadow. I haven't actually seen the Joker, but I've heard a lot about it. It's I need to. It's good. We yeah. won't we won't say anything else. Yeah. Um, Ned, where can people find you at? What's your Twitter, Instagram, Facebook? Um, I don't music? have a whole lot of social media. Um, but it's just Ned Lee on Facebook. I don't really have any music page set up yet, so I cool. gotta get on that. Nice. Well, uh, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Of course. Good to see you. Good to see you, too.